How you guys doing? You doing good? Happy Sunday morning. God is good. Yeah. All right, you may be seated. Hey, listen, we're gonna um, we're gonna do some stuff this morning. We're uh, we're actually gonna dive into the Word here, and we're gonna do a quick study of First Corinthians chapter four, and this is gonna be good. We're gonna dive into that, and then we're gonna do water baptism. Um, and we had a great water baptism this morning, a bunch of people, but, but in this service, very, very special because uh, uh, our friend Alec here is going to be getting baptized in this service. Um, and then we're going to give of our tithes and our offerings, and then we're going to just respond and just worship Jesus together um, as a family, just welcome Holy Spirit just to come and, and do whatever he's doing. Um, I'll be sneaking out early out of praise and worship. Carol, hopefully that's okay with you. Um, and, uh, and Peter and I, we're, we're heading over to Yakima to go do a 2.30 service um, at the Journey Church in Yakima. And then I think we've got around uh, 15 people, a bunch of wild ones from SRC, driving over to Yakima um, for, for a 6 p.m. service there. We've got four churches coming together tonight just to go after the presence of the Lord, just, just to see what Jesus wants to do. So that's cool. So um, if you're not going to be in Yakima tonight, um, if you could just be praying for us and our team, that Jesus would just show up and Jesus would just show off and lives would be changed. That would be, that'd be super amazing. Um, awesome. If you got your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And um, uh, I pray that this is actually the best uh, study of the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 4 that you have ever been through in your life. I believe it's going to be, you know, and, and the reason why I say it is because um, there's a good chance that most likely this is the only study of this entire chapter in one sitting. And so I, I pray I don't have a lot of competition um, this morning, um, and, uh, but it, it will be good. We're going we're gonna to take this whole chapter. Last week, we did the entire chapter three. We're, um, you know, we're eating big chunks of steak um, at a time. And since I know you're an src -er, I know that you love steak. Okay, um, we're going to just basically uh, dive right, 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 right into this. Um, I will catch you up really quick. We have been studying this now for six weeks. We're, we're four chapters in, and we're dealing now still with the same issue. So Paul has given to this book four chapters dealing with the first issue in Corinth, the first issue being division in the church. And the good news is, is that this is the last week that we'll be dealing with division, and then we'll get to move on to a new issue. Yay! You know? But this is, this is a big deal, and, um, and just in case you didn't hear, there was an election this last week, and things in our country are pretty divided right now, um, and things in the church are pretty divided right now. So I just think it's appropriate that the way that the Lord has planned this, that we still get one more week to talk about division here on kind of election weekend, you know, and then also knowing that, um, that when we leave today, there will be no more division inside of us. We'll be perfectly unified and then we'll get to, you know, come on, you got to declare a thing, you know, and then when we come back next Sunday, we can deal with a new issue. <laughs> yeah, you know, so... So it's still division. Now, last week, one of the things that Paul talked about was, one of the things that, that was happening in the church was that Christians were engaged with idolatry through preacher worship. So they were worshiping preachers. And that was becoming problematic in that if, if, if people were subscribing to Cephas as their primary teacher, their allegiance and loyalty would be to Cephas to the degree of turning their hearts against Paul or turning their hearts against Apollos. So last week, Paul was talking about equality in ministry and that we all kind of work together. There's not one ministry or one preacher that does everything. Paul says one comes along and plants and another comes along and, and waters 
you know, and then what are we to say? This, the, the planter is more important than the water or the, you know, and like, and so sometimes we can play those, those kinds of games. And, and that's what was happening in, in Corinth. People were, people were following preachers instead of following Christ. And that's happening even today. You know, that sometimes it's easy to find ourselves in a certain stream. You know, I'm in the prophetic stream, you know. You know well, I'm in the apostolic stream. What does that mean? I don't know. You know, I, 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 I'm in the evangelistic stream. You know, how many people believe? Oh, well, it's not about that, you know. But it's just like, you know, like it's, so many times we look for labels because a label can contribute to our identity. It can make us feel more important. And sometimes... That sense of self-importance is, is so needed that we are okay with belittling other people in order to make us feel even that much more important. So Paul is really um, addressing that. But that's the past. Let's get into the present. All right. First Corinthians chapter 4. Um, this is what he says. This is how one should regard us. Speaking out, this is how you should look at preachers. This is how you should look at apostles. Okay? This is how you should look at us, is what Paul's saying. Us being Cephas, Apollos. Paul, okay, Jesus, this is how you should regard us, as servants, everyone say servants, servants and stewards of the mysteries of God, isn't that awesome, this is how you should look at apostles, that apostles are servants or stewards of the mysteries of God, what does that mean, a mystery is where you're asking a question and the question doesn't have an answer, how many of you got really big questions that you're asking God, but your questions don't have clear, concise answers? And that's frustrating. That's frustrating because we're part of the Google generation, right, where we expect to have an answer like that. We want our answers like we, like, like, we like our church and like we like our McDonald's. We want the number four. We want it like, like in and out, in and out. Like, you know, give me my daily bread, you know, like in and out, you know. I, I pay my tithe, you know, come out, you know. Um, you know, and, and the problem with that is God. If you're going to get into God, you're going to get into some mysteries. And you're going to have to be okay with that. This is what the Bible says, that his peace surpasses all understanding. Do you want to know what that means? In the kingdom, there's going to be a lot of stuff you don't understand. You're going to have to be okay with that. And the only way you're going to be okay with that is that the Prince of Peace so if you're looking at your life, if you're looking at the world, if you're looking at the news, and you're just like, you know, get on Facebook, like, what's he doing? Gunning everyone down. Like, I, like it, and that's coming from a place, like, like, sometimes we just go out of control when we're not in control. This is an invitation, you guys, to be a servant, to be a steward of mystery. Saying, I don't have the answer. So this is an invitation into intimacy. And this is what Paul says. Hey, look at us. Look at, the, look at the apostles. We are servants. We are stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Really super cool here. When you think about the word servant, okay, don't think of like old school slaves. Don't think of, you know, this isn't like, um, this isn't slavery, what this word servant and steward, it refers to the Greek noun referring to the highest ranking servant of a wealthy landowner who was in charge of the entire estate. Okay? Um, this would be, oh, this is horrible. This is kind of a sin. I just totally forgot who Batman's butler was. Alfred! Alfred! I repent. God, I, I, what, what, cam, what camera's on right now? This one? That's not my good side. Michael, I told you to keep that one up. Um, I repent to the church globally for forgetting the name of Batman's butler. It's Alfred. And that's what this name, me, that's what this is. That this isn't just, this isn't a slave down in the slave quarters. Everybody knows Alfred was in charge of Bruce Wayne's entire estate. Alfred was, Alfred was the man, Alfred's what, always the one that's like, Master Bruce, aren't you forgetting something? Like, oh, that's right, the Batmobile, right? Like, this is a picture of the apostolic. This is a picture 
that you should see apostles as master servants of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Verse 3, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me, therefore do not pronounce judgment before it's time, before the Lord comes. Who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, and who will disclose it for the purposes of the heart? Then each one will receive his, uh, his, his commendation um, from God. And this is what Paul is saying here in the text. He's saying, like, he knows that because he's getting very, very real and because he's telling the truth, okay, because, because he's confronting some things, he knows that the readers of this letter are going to get a little bit judgy, okay? Because and, and, that's kind of what happens. Like, when you have to confront some things, um, oftentimes people will try to turn that, turn that around. There's one, there's one scripture verse that every, Christ, that every non-Christian knows. So people aren't, there's one scripture verse. They don't know where it's at, but they know it's in the Bible. And it's this scripture verse. Don't judge. The Bible says, don't judge. Where's that at? I don't know, but it says it. The Bible says, don't judge. And, you know, okay, cool. But, so Paul's talking about this. Hey, I'm telling you the truth. I know some of you are going to get a little judgy. This is what I think. I really could care less about your judgment against me. That, that's what he says. Uh, it, you know, th- th- there's a saying in Canada, you know, and it's, uh, you know, th- like, if, if he's Canadian, he'd say, I, he'd say, I couldn't, <laughs> that's New York, you know, he's like, you know, I couldn't give a hoot about your judgment. Okay, they don't say that, but it, it's fun to say hoot, and I have a connection there between can and hoot. But I don't give a hoot, eh? like, this is what Paul says. Like, I, I'm sorry, I, like, I could care less about your judgments against me. That's what, that's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I don't even judge myself. And you're like, aren't you supposed to judge yourself? And this is, what, this is what Paul says. He says, because I'm not aware of anything that's condemning me internally. My, my conscience is clean. Why is that important? Because if your soul is condemning you, the world will be condemning you. If your own soul is condemning you, if your own soul is judging you, everything that you look at will be through lenses of judgment. Which means that your expectation will be for rejection to the degree that you sabotage your own success because expectation is faith, even negative expectation that can frame out a negative future because of the power of our beliefs. This is the will of God for every believer, for every person here, that you would step into a revelation that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. Therefore, your past has no condemning value for you in the present. You're not that person anymore. That person's dead, you know, six feet under, rest in peace. You know, you are a new you. You are a new brew. This is a new thing. And therefore, Paul says, like, we all know Paul did some shady stuff. (laughs) And this is what Paul says. Can't touch this. This is what Paul says. I wouldn't even touch this. Like, what Jesus has done is so real that even I don't even condemn me. And that's the kind of freedom that Jesus wants for you to step into today. That you, today, your past would have no condemning authority over your present. And that when people try to shame you because of yesterday, you could be like, that yesterday me died. Why? Because as of today, November 8th, 2020, I have stepped into a new creation reality. And it's, and it's, literally, that, that, it's literally that real. It's, it's if you believe in your heart, what's your heart? That's, your, that's the seat of your emotions, your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's that I, be, I believe, and I declare it with my mouth, that Jesus is Lord. You don't need feelings, but oftentimes they will follow. And it's just that easy in a moment 
born again into a new world, into a new reality, into a new grace, into a new place. And your, your brain won't believe it. This is where Paul talks about the renewing of the mind. Literally having your mind washed with the water of the word and stepping into this new reality where when the enemy comes to condemn you or to remind you of your, of your past, you can remind the enemy of his future. That was a Carmen line. So it says here, <laughs> I can't take the credit. I've got to give glory where glory's due. So <laughs> it says here, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before it's time. Don't cast premature judgment because this is causing division. That when we are dropping the gavel on other people, like saying that basically God's grace can't be afforded to them because of something, you know, that they've done, that we are prematuring. Like, this is what Paul said. The day is going to come when everything, when the, when the lights turn on and everything is just going to be in the light. The day is when it comes and it's just, you know, there it is. And in, that, and in that moment, the righteous judge will make a righteous judgment, but that we are limited in our, okay, so let's just do this. This will be a little painful, but I love you. <laughs> sometimes you got to do that. Like, sometimes there's a little bit of immaturity where you got to scratch people's back before you tell them the truth. So anyways, here, here's, the, here's the thing. Um, some people think that we have a righteous obligation to cast judgment on Biden because we have all of this information that, that we have an obligation to, to cast a judgment against him because of all the information. We, ha we have insider information. And I would ask you this question, um, has the Lord dropped his gavel on him yet? And if so, if Jesus has judged him, then you go ahead and judge him. And then others would say that, that we have the right to cast a judgment on Donald Trump. He's a racist. He's misogynist. He's a, he's a homophobe. He's all this stuff. That we have a right to cast all these judgments on him as well with all these blatant, because of all the information that we know from the trustworthy media. Like, they're so trustworthy, like, on both sides. Like, they only speak the truth. So we, we are, we have, we should, we should listen to the news, to the media, because that's truth, and that's revelation. And then we should take all of that truth and make a self-righteous judgment against an authority, and that we should use our creative breath to curse them. That that is, all, that is what we should do. And this is what Paul's talking about. This is where division comes from. This is what's called worldly wisdom, not wisdom from the Spirit. We're just talking. We're just hanging out. We're, we're, just, we're just having a good time and stuff. How do you know that you're partnering with worldly wisdom? Because the kingdom of God is not manifesting in you in, in a tangible way. Like the frequency coming off of you is not righteousness. It's not peace. And it's not joy. The frequency that's coming off of you just, just is like, it just sounds like the sounds of war. What is that? You could actually YouTube the sounds of war and just, and just sit there and meditate in it. How do I know that? I don't, I don't know why I should know that. But you could, but like this, and, and some of you, your soul, it sounds like the sounds of war. The problem with that is that is not what the spirit of Christ Jesus sounds like right now. That's what we call dissonance. And this is what Paul says. He says, hey, the reason why you got all this division among you is that you're operating according to worldly wisdom and you think that you've got the right to be finger pointing. You think that you've got the self-righteous right to be casting judgments and it's premature and it's immature and we've got to grow up. Yeah, and it's easy to do with political candidates, but like the real here is happening in the body. 
And guess what? At Seattle Revival Center, it's happening in the body. And it is time for us to mature and for us to untether from this system saying, I'm not going to be a pawn. I'm not going to be in this little thing where I'm just taking in all this information. Oh, yeah, this is the truth. This is the truth. Look at me. I'm woke. You are not woke. You're tethered to a weird manipulative thing that's costing you kingdom bandwidth. How many, how, like, like, let's, like, and Paul's going to talk here, and I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm getting super excited. So we're going to just keep reading. We go to verse 6, and I'm going to read starting in verse 6 out of the Passion Translation. And it says here, Dear brothers and sisters, I am referring elusively to myself and Apollos in order to illustrate what I've been saying. It is futile to move beyond, from the first service, somebody came up to me and said, you should go a little slower. <laughs> and the problem is, man, I got a whole chapter I got to do. You know, I got, we got baptism. I got to get on the road. So... You don't like it? Tough. Here we go. So this is what he said. It is futile to move beyond what is written in the scriptures and be inflated, look at me, with self-importance by following and promoting one leader. Look at how awesome he is in competition with another. He's awesome and he's not awesome. For what makes a distinction between you and someone else, that sense of self-importance and that sense that they're awesome, enlightened, not enlightened, revelation, no revelation. Paul says this is nonsense. And he says, and what do you have? that grace has not given to you, that you've received it as a gift, why do you boast as though there is something special about you? Paul's like, you know, like, you know, you've read one too many identity books. You know, I'm a snowflake and you're a rock. Yeah, you're a snowflake. That's, a, that's because of the grace of God. And if you're operating according to grace, you don't get to boast about this. Like, when you're operating according to grace, you can be like, yeah, God has done a good thing. Zang. But God can do it in you, too. That grace does not say, we're the righteous, we're the elect. Those are the dirty homosexuals. Those are the, those are the Democrats. Those are, we're the righteous, we're the clean. We've achieved so many things. Things. No, that is, that, that, that is stinky menstrual rags as according to what the Bible says. That is self-righteousness. That is, that is a front. That is a, a diss against the power of the gospel. And we are better than that. That is so human. And, and you ain't one. Or good, good English would say, and you isn't one. Okay, so it says here, you receive this as, uh, as a grace. And so, verse 8, already you have, now this is, <laughs> Paul about to get snarky. Like, verse 8, Paul turns up the sarcasm. I just apologize on behalf of Paul. This is not very pastoral. But sometimes... Sometimes Paul just goes off on these things. Thank God I never do that. So this is what he says. <laughs> look at He's like, look at you guys. This is what he says, verse 8. Look at you guys. You have all that you want. You've become rich. Without us, you have become kings. Oh, look at you that you would reign so that we should share rule with you, exclamation point, exclamation point. He's turning it on thick. He's like, look at you. You've got all that you want. You're rich. You think you're king. Then we should rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited in us apostles that we're last at, at, of all. Look at you guys. So amazing. Look at us. We're the last of these. You're the most important of these. Like men. We are like men sentenced to death because we we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are the fools for Christ's sake. But look at you. You're the wise in Christ. We are weak, but you're the strong. All right. And you are held in honor, and we are held in disrepute. Uh, and he says... Um, Bless you. To, pr to the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, and we are still, like the scum of the earth, the trash of all things. Look at, look, at, look at Paul says, Paul says, hey, look at you guys. You guys got your act together, and we look like a train wreck, and we're the apostles, and you're the church of Corinth. 
you guys got all this wealth and all this finance, and, and we're homeless. And then this is what Paul is saying. Hey, um, I think your Christianity needs to be recalibrated because you have made it something that it looks nothing like Jesus. And, and I am telling you this, this is a message for the church of Jesus Christ in America. We think we're wiser than we are. We think we're richer than we are. We think we are in need of nothing, but we are in need of a desperate need of Christ Jesus and his anointing and his revelation. I'm telling you that we are in an opportunity right now to truly repent. Everyone thinks that repenting means that like you got to tear your clothes. Like I swear I'll stop swearing on 405. Jesus forgave me. Like no, no, no. Repentance means you come into a new perspective. You come up and you see differently. And because you see differently, you behave differently. It's not, repentance is not behavior modification. You know, <laughs> I will not flip the bird. I will not flip the bird. I will not flip the bird. That is not repentance. You know, Re- repentance is a whole new world. I love people. I love Jesus. And enchanting, however it goes. That is repentance. It's I can see that wherever you have sin in your life and you care or you just don't care, it's who I am, it's what I do, has it affected me? Yeah. You just, it's, you're blind in that area. That's just what I do. No, you're just blind in that area. That repentance means, God, show me, show me your world. Show me myself in your eyes. I repent of, of religious thinking. I repent of using my formulas. I want to be operating according to the Spirit. Ah. And this is what he says here. We have become the apostles, the outcast, like the scum of the world, meaning that according to worldly logic, we are unsuccessful. This is my question for Sierra Bible Center. Are we okay with not looking like every other church? Are we okay with looking unsuccessful? Are we okay with being cloaked in the foolishness of Christ? Are we okay with being made fun of? Are we okay to be, oh, you go where? Because this is what I know. That every move of God is qualified and noted by the persecution upon the move because whenever God does a thing, it's always a new thing and the people that were a part of the last thing are always the first ones to reject the next thing. Which means that if you're praying for another Azusa Street, you're praying for the wrong thing. Why? He doesn't have a Xerox machine in heaven where he's going to come and take a Zuza Street, put it on a Xerox machine. Because 2020 doesn't need a Xerox machine. All of creation is groaning and waiting, not for another Welsh revival. All of creation is groaning and waiting for the sons and daughters of God to wake up, (coughs) repent, come to the penthouse, and realize who they are, whose they are, and where they are. And all of a sudden, our behaviors will be in alignment with the kingdom of God. Okay, okay, all right. Okay, good. Good. Verse 14. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I like this. Because he got, he, got, he got really snarky and he got really sarcastic. He got really loud. Um, and then he said something. And this, is, this would be good for all of us. I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. Listen, things are weird in America. Things are weirder in the church in America. That's the truth. But I do not say these things to shame the church in America because this is not about shame or condemnation. This is a great invitation from our Father in heaven to step through the portal into the unknown, to step into the mysteries of God, to say, I don't know what it'll look like. I don't know what it'll smell like. I, 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 I've never been to Narnia before. It feels kind of cold. And yet we're going to step into the wardrobe, not knowing where it's taking us, but we will 
you'll say, in God we trust. Let's go there. Let's go together. Let's seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that all these things will be added unto us. At Seattle Revival Center, meeting budget is not the win. At Seattle Revival Center, filling seats is not the win. Although it's more fun to speak to people than to seats. But... At Seattle Revival Center, every member having a conviction that they are a minister, whether or not they're in construction, a janitor, a teacher, a banker, or they're a church planter, that we have equal importance, and we've all been called to have a revelation of our kingdom significance, knowing that everything we do is a prophetic drama. We've been called by God to minister the redemption of Christ Jesus and the restoration of Christ Jesus to to bring heaven to earth. Every SRC here, a revelation that they are a minister and not just a minister, but a supernatural minister. Called by God, anointed by God, commissioned by God, ordained by God for such a time as this. Let's just take a break. You guys doing good? I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling with you. (laughs) Verse 17. This is why I've sent you Timothy. We'll we'll read more about Timothy. He's my beloved and faithful young Patty one. I've sent him to you to remind you of the ways of Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I'm coming as the Lord wills. And I will find you. (laughs) And we're going to check out your power. That's what he says. I'm coming. The arrogant say I'm not coming. But I am coming. And when I come, we're going to see where your power is at. For the kingdom of God, it, it ain't talk. But it's power. Declare that with me. The kingdom of God, God. it ain't talk. talk. It's power. (laughs) What does that mean? True wisdom, wisdom of the spirit, is confirmed and demonstrated with power from on high. Yeah. And it says, I like this last verse that we'll look at. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? In other words, this is what he says. I'm coming. We're going to talk. We're going to see what's up. And you get to choose. And this is metaphorical. But you can have baby powder or gunpowder. He said, I'm, I, I can come with the rod. What do you do with the rod? You beat people metaphorically or I can come with the spirit of gentleness this is an opportunity to get new perspective to repent to come into a new way of thought and what is this all of this this is love this is tough love why because we see here that he is a father he says in verse 14 I do not write these scenes to shame you but to admonish you as my beloved children. For you have countless guides in Christ, but many of you do not have fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Would you declare this with me? I am a father. Or if you're a woman, (laughs) declare this, I am a mother. This is the disposition that the Lord wants to bring to us at Seattle Bible Center. That every man would say, I am a father. And that every woman would say, I am a mother. Why? When I see somebody else's kids goofing off, you know what I'll say? (laughs) It's not mine. (laughs) When I see my own kids doing their thing, we have... A conversation. One of my roles uh, as being a dad is taking certain options off of the table. 
So I remember, and Peter's here in the service. He's here in the first service. He already heard this, so he'll be, he'll be ready to roll with this in this service. But I remember one time when my kids were younger, they were doing something. They were just doing something, and it was not good at all. And we had a conversation. And this is what I told them. You know, some families, that might be what they do. The problem is, you're a stot. And in our house, that's not what we do. So that will not be happening again. Do we understand? This is what Paul says. I am speaking to you this way because you are my children. The Lord has made me a father. And because I love you, I will tell you the truth. And this is what Paul is saying. In the kingdom of God, we don't do division. This is what Paul is saying. Hey, in Corinth, we don't do man worship. In Corinth, we don't use our words to undermine and reduce and tear down. That might, that might be what they do in other cities. That might be what they do in other churches. But here's the problem. You're in Corinth, and you're my spiritual children, and I'm taking division off of the table. We will not be rolling with that. Okay, okay, good, good, good. All right, so, yeah, three of you. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Four of you, five, six, seven. I see that hand. All right, Seattle Revival Center. In our family, we don't do that. We don't use our words and our influence and our Facebook and our Twitter to do that. We're taking that option off of the table. Why? We are family. God is our Papa, and so regardless of our differences, we will protect the unity of the church for the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the ancient of days, and this kingdom thing that involves eternity is going to last a little longer than our four-year political cycle. So we cannot use who we are to shred the hearts of people that are family because of worldly, chronos, time-bound, created thinking and wisdom. And here's, here's, here's the last thing I have. Do you remember before you knew Jesus? Okay, good. How many of you before you knew Jesus, like, you were, you were pretty shady? Okay. Like, how many of you, like, before you knew Jesus, like, you wouldn't even want you in your own house? Like, you'd be hiding stuff before you come over, right? Before you knew Jesus, all, listen, all you had was division. That's all you had in your own heart. That your own soul was condemning you. That, that you felt most likely like looking at who you were before Jesus and thinking about who God is, this feeling of like, like how do I even do this thing with like God is against me, people are against me. Before you knew Jesus, like and, and how many of you ever had times when like your own soul was just beating you down? You're an idiot. Why would you do that again? You said you'd never do that. Are you serious? That guy? You know, but serious, that gal? Are you serious? Like, you're there again? You swore, you said division, division, all this internal division, all this hate. How many of you remember before you, before you knew Jesus, just ripping into people? Just like, how many of you were like yellers before you knew Jesus? Before you knew Jesus, you were a screamer, and you would just scream, you know? But once you met Jesus, there was a reconciliation and a peace that came into your heart. There was a peace with who you, who you are in the Lord. There was just this sense of, wow, I am in. Wow, I am loved. And now I can, now I can love each other. Guys, for this reason, a political candidate will never unify our country and also for this reason, a political candidate can't really divide our country because the division or the unity is already in the human heart. It just gets manifested or exploited by triggers. You're either in unity or there's division here. There's either peace here or rage. But the contents of your heart are the contents of your heart. 
It's already there. It's just whatever triggers manipulate them and get them to flare up. And for this reason, this is a great year for all of us to get saved again. Because some of us have let the dead us seat back in. And we think it's okay. And Paul's like, nope. And Pastor Darren's like, nope. I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a bitter, nasty, vindictive person to you. So let's just repent of that. Even like a little teaspoon of it. I kind of had a little poopy pants this last week. Yeah, kind of had to clean up my act a little bit this last week. But there's grace. There's grace. Papa God comes with a little, little wipey. Clean up your little hiney. It's an opportunity for us to mature. To say, I will not tolerate division in my heart. I'm part of a higher system. I'm part of a higher government. I'm part of a higher frequency. I'm a son. And I can't afford to be tethered to that frequency of division and hatred and victimization. I don't want you to think that now abortion's just going to continue to and GLBT, the whole, all this, all this stuff. We're being told all this. This is what I want, this is what I want you to, to believe. We're going from glory to glory. We're going from glory to glory. And maybe legislating righteousness isn't the solution. Maybe, maybe we can do incredible things without expecting any sort of votes in return. That point where you do something amazing on the earth and somebody asks you what church you go to and you just disappear. It's not about that. It's about him. Love you guys. You are loved by God. He's got a big call. He's put so many amazing things in you. Whatever you need. If you've got stuff that's keeping you, you've got some demons that's keeping you, you let us know. We'll send them to hell. You got, you got, some, you got some addictions, you got some baggage, we'll get you connected, we'll get you accountable. You got some out of, con out of control lust stuff, Awesome, you're at the best church. We've got, some, we've got some conquerors here in this church. We've got some giant heads here in this church. We do, giant heads. We've taken down some giants. All right, so whatever it is, whatever it is keeping you, whatever it is that's like cost you your destiny, that place where like you haven't been able to be used by the Lord, whatever is keeping you, you'll let us know, Right? Right? You'll let us know, right? And I don't know what's coming in the future. Corona or, or some sort of evolve, Ebola, like some sort of ah, UFOs. I don't know what the future holds. But this is what I know. We will fear no stinking evil. And we've learned so much in 2020. That there's certain mistakes we won't make again. And we're changing everything. We'll be ready to go underground. We're like, like I'm telling you, we're changing everything. We will be able to do discipleship, restoration, conversion, deliverance, no matter what the future. Because it has to look like the book of Acts. It can't look like just what we've been doing in America for the last hundred years. And that means that I need you. I need you, James. Yeah, that, that's, why, that's why I need you. Yeah. Jeff and Lynn. That's what, you're like, you're needed. Because Phil Pearson, Lou, you're, you're in it. Like the stuff that God's going to be calling us to do, I'm not going to be able to do it. It's going to take a body. So we're, we're going to invert everything. We're going to change everything. Home groups are going to be changing. They're going to look like home churches. Activation school is going to be changing. You, you guys are going to be teaching activation school. You're, it's going to be totally different. Immersion school, that's going to be a new thing. Everything's going to be, and, and, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to be seeing people awakened in their identity and destiny in Jesus Christ. 
Every week, we're going to see people awaken to their identity and destiny in Jesus. Like, it's just going to be happening all the time. People being awakened. People just, oh, a whole new. Like, it's just like, every week. And it's going to be you. And you're going to be doing it. And you're going to, like, you might even have to call and be like, I got a demon. It won't come out. We're like, all right, we're sending in Phil and Jay. Like, like you know, like, like we're sending in Gwen Merritt. She, she, she's got the stuff. Yeah, like, I got a person. The cancer just won't come out. And it always stinking comes out. Get over here. Church is going to start looking a lot more like Ghostbusters. It's going to start looking a lot more like the book of Acts. Because as long as people are perishing, as long as nations, as long as cities, as long as people haven't heard the good news of Jesus Christ, then we've got a role to play. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really pumped. I'm really pumped because I get to do it with you guys. And you guys are stinking crazy. You guys are so wild. Pre-service prayer. Prayer is going to be really important. You're going to want to be in pre-service prayer. Right now they're praying at 9, um, at 8 a.m. And they also pray at 10 a.m. before the second service. So get into pre-service prayer. Prayer is going to be like the batteries in this thing. It's going to be like salt. I don't know you. I put salt in everything. So we're going to have everything praying. We're going to have everything. In the, in the prayer meeting this morning, we had, I don't know, 15 kids in there just praying, getting words from the Lord. The uh, first service, all these kids were getting prophetic words and just, this thing has to be intergenerational. There's certain things God can't do unless we empower our kids. It's got to be multi-ethnic. I know we're just talking. But I'm just sowing. I'm just sowing. You're going to get ideas. You're going to get dreams. And you're not, and you're not, going, to be, and you're not going to need permission from Darren to do it. Because I'm, I'm giving you permission right now. You are authorized. Like, it's time. It's time. It's time. Look, I, I know you're submitted. I'm submitted to you. We're in this together. We're accountable together. You get weird, I'll call you up. Deal? I get weird, you call me up. But don't be, don't be waiting for Darren to, to, to be like, now's the time. No, Jesus says, now's the time. Go, 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 go. Good news, good news, good news, good news, good news. If you got bad news, I'm telling you, it's a great year to get saved again. Good news. We're going to good news everything until it begins to transfigure and look, look like Jesus. Small Business Sunday is coming up. Rebecca, the Lord gave Rebecca a vision for Small Business Sunday. We're going to have a Sunday. All, all of our small business owners are going to come up. We're going to anoint them with oil. We're going to believe as a community for supernatural favor and increase. Come on, all our small business. We're doing a survey. Rebecca's putting out a survey. Um, you're going to have a list of all of our businesses that you put on your refrigerator. So every day, you're, you're blessing our kingdom entrepreneurs in, in, the, in the church. We'll have a list of all of them um, in the prayer room. Um, uh, and we're going to be looking at practically serving our, our and, and that's just the start. We're just looking at how do we activate? How do we equip? How do we equip? How do we bless? How do we see a supernatural anointing come on the efforts of what people are doing here, here at the church? Melanie's going to be selling lots of homes in 2021. It's going to be crazy. She's going to buy me some steak. It's going to be so good. Anyways, now is, you need to hear this stuff because the kingdom of God is at hand for such a time as this. Don't let your spirit be sad or disillusioned. It is time for Sierra Bible Center to arise and shine for such a time as this. All right, good. <laughs> okay, so Anne-Marie, are you there? Anne-Marie, come on. God bless. Good to see you. Watch your step right here. Big step. I see you got the, the official SRC baptism garb here at this one. That's awesome. That's awesome. You can be seated there, Amory. Amory, why, why are you being baptized this morning? Oh, because I love Jesus. <laughs> Good. <laughs> and I want him to have all of me, just everything. And I'm ready to be a son. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> oh, the season has been, um, he said it was a season of cleansing. And then he, he showed me it wasn't just for me. It's for the world. Where he's just washing. Um, but there's been a lot of crying. <laughs> and he's like, 
you're about to reap, you're about to reap up all, all the joy, all the, all, the, all the water that's been put in to the ground. It's, I feel like I've been kind of buried, you know? I've, he's yeah. like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for you to come up. And it's like, you're going to see the light in its fullness. And so this is just another awesome. <laughs> step into that. Good, that's good. Anne-Marie, <laughs> do you confess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Do, do you believe that he died on a cross for all your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he was buried in a grave where he resurrected on the third day? Yes, I do. Do you believe that he has ascended and is seated at the right hand of the mm-hmm. Father where he makes intercession for you? Yes. <laughs> Upon profession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll just bless you real quick here. Come on. Stretch out your hands. We'll bless her. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Fire. You're fire, God. You're fire, God. Fresh fire, God. Fresh fire, God. A fresh impartation, Lord. Your character, your nature, your power, God. Yeah, we declare breaker anointing. That breaker, breaker plays. He is the Lord of the breakthrough. And we celebrate this fresh touch of heaven upon your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. Awesome. Bless you, bless you, bless you. And now we have Alec. Alec, awesome. Alec, Alec is coming. It'll take a few minutes here. Jesus. Hi, Alec. Good to see you, buddy. God bless you. Come on. This will be great. Dive in. Yeah, yeah. Head first. Not use the shallow side. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> You can just sit right there on the side there, Alec. There you go. Oh, sorry, buddy. We got you. Ask him. Oh. There you go. Good. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. I can take your arm right here, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's the step right there. You can just sit. Perfect. What's that? Okay. The, the hands can let go. I'm being held by the higher one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Be seat. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Woo! <laughs> Alec, hey, why are you being baptized today? God has allowed me to start a new life in mind, body, and spirit. Well, he's worked on the body part. I'm working on today the spirit part. Awesome. Good. To be reborn. Awesome. 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 Alec, do you declare Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Absolutely. Do you believe that he died on a cross for all your sins, sickness, disease, all, infirmity, all that stuff? Absolutely. <laughs> do you believe that he was buried and he resurrected from the dead on the third day? Yes. Do you believe that he ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father where he makes intercession for you? Thank God, yes I do. Upon profession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit into the Lord Jesus Christ. pray for you real quick. Stretch out your hands. We'll just pray for you real quick. Father, thank you for your presence and your power. Thank you for a fresh touch of heaven. Father, I thank you that it's not by his might, nor by his power, but it's by your spirit. Father, I thank you, Lord, for a fresh infilling right now, fresh infilling right now of your spirit, God. The same fire that came upon Mount Sinai. Same fire that spoke from the burning bush. The same fire that descended upon the 120 in the upper room. That that same fire, that same relational power, that same relational glory presence would come right now and fill Alec afresh right now. Right now, 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 right now. Filled, 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 filled with that resurrection power, that resurrection life right now. Yep, 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 yep. Bringing that, that unity between the spirit and the body and the soul. Bringing unity right now. Yeah, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. For Alex's union with you. Thank you, Lord, that this is a son in whom you are well please a son in whom your favor and power and glory rest and so father I thank you for a new realm of glory that is beginning to open wide right in front of Alec that he'll be able to see into his father's world that he'll be able to see and speak I see you seeing and speaking I see you seeing and creating I just declare a creating a manifest a manifesting glory of God to actualize the grace of God and to bring it into the present. Father, I thank you. It is a new day. Lord, I thank you. It is a new day. And your mercies are new every morning. And God, we rejoice that the work that you're doing in Alec, it is good and glorious and that you will finish what you have started in this man of God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, buddy. Love you, man. That was so good. Awesome. Pastor Anthony.